reflect back on this trip two years ago, your, your thoughts on your return to Oxford? Well, I, I'll jump in really quick um, to say it's been quite a journey. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a tough one. A uh, very emotional project. But Vladimir's an inspiration and uh, he really got us through this. We wanted to tell his story. And uh, we're thankful for everyone here for helping us tell the story and get this out to the world. I think um, what Paul said is, is absolutely true. Uh, we had a lot of obstacles, just, um, you know, you face normal obstacles doing a project like this, and then you face the pandemic and uh, a couple different issues with Vladimir's health along the way. And we couldn't ever give up because, um, because he was an example to all of us about persevering and surviving. So um, anything that, any obstacles that we hit along the way were really minor. And um, we were just committed to doing this and we're so fortunate to be able to work with him through this pro this whole process and um, and end up with this end result. One thing I will say is Vladimir kept saying, when are you gonna be done? I need to stay alive so I can see the end of this. <laughs> okay, if I can say something. <laughs> I just wanted to say the final goodbye to them. And here we got the opportunity to her, so I asked her to accompany me, because without her, I wouldn't be able, what I found out, I wouldn't be able to make the trip. Second, when I was there, you know, I didn't know what to expect. When you come after 75 years to a place that basically changed your life, because in one moment I became, I lost my parents, I lost everybody, and I didn't know what to expect from the life. When I returned, after I was liberated, I had two choices. Either my life, my active life, ended with the concentration camp, and many of Holocaust survivors lived their future life in memory or memori mem in memory of the concentration camp. Or I will try to make new life for myself, the life that would be normal. So we, when I got married and we had children, we practically never talked about Holocaust. We never told them, eat this or eat that, or if you will have this in concentration camp, you will be happy or you will be lucky to have this. When they didn't want to eat it, they didn't eat it. There was one exception. Our, old, our youngest, older son didn't like cauliflower. <laughs> and he was forced, because we were used to finish our dish, he was forced to sit at the table in the baby chair over the plate with cauliflower. Once he fell asleep and we found him with his <laughs> But then we found out that when we renamed cauliflower and gave it a different name, he started to eat it. 
<laughs> it was not the taste of the cauliflower, it was the name. It was repulsive to him. So we named it in Czech, Kvietaken, he ate it. But I think that he still remember it. He will be here next week. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to tell you. That, and surprisingly, a really private trip developed and changed in two years into something that can fill this beautiful place. I cannot say that I hope that you enjoyed the movie, there was nothing enjoyable in the movie, but it was at least, let's say, educational. For many of you, it showed the first time how it really looked in concentration camp. And just a few words to this. When you, you had to have a strong will to survive, they were people who were religious and they were praying and they believed that it was God's will that they survived. I am not very religious and I chose the other way, I just hated. I hated the Nazis and my hope was that I will survive and I will be able to kill the Nazis. I will not talk about if I killed or not killed, but there was something that had to be a drive in every person to survive. Once the person lost the will to survive, it died in weeks or days sometimes. So, in all your life you have a certain will to do something and you try to do it and usually you succeed. Congratulations to it. I succeeded in my way. Then I, of course, after a certain period of time when you live in the civilized society, you not only that you lose the will to kill, you don't need to have this. But the fact is that we never know how a person who is civilized whom you talk to, whom is this you deal with, how would such a person act if it will not be in civilized society? I used for many years to look at anybody whom I met and try to imagine how this person would deal or handle me if, it, if, if the Nazis would win and this guy or this lady would be in the uniform of a Nazi officer. Would they be human or would they be less than human? And we have to try to just keep our acting, dealing in the human range. And I hope that we will do it. I'm going to invite you to come on down, come stand right with me to ask the questions. In the meantime, while folks are working their way down, probably a lot of people are wondering how challenging was this to shoot this film, to, to go where this was happening with hundreds and thousands of people and, and shoot this film? Well, it was complex because it was fast. We just really had a couple weeks to make all of the arrangements. We had no funding, so we got our credit cards out. And it was, you know, it was, there was a lot to it. We went to Prague after we were in Auschwitz and we were, um, when we shot in Prague, the biggest synagogue, and we went to Pardubica, which really, there was so much, like this could be a, easily a two or three hour documentary, but um, in doing it for the PBS format, which, was, which our goal is to get distribution on, on PBS, it's 56 minutes, so, the biggest thing is just trying to tell the story in 56 minutes when, you know, Vladimir's life is, I calculated maybe 844,000 hours or so uh, up till this point. And, uh, and so you have an hour to tell not only, you know, a man's life story, but also the story, of, some of the story of the war uh, a little bit. So I think those are big challenges, but um, it, uh, it, it really everything went 
you know, extremely well. We got tremendous cooperation from the U.S. Holocaust Museum, which uh, we noted on there. Yad Vashem, you know, everyone has been helpful. So it's really been gratifying. And uh, we've gotten a lot of people write to us with donations and then talk about Vladimir. Uh, today I got an email and a donation from one of your students, Vladimir, who, uh, Marguerite Heck, she is now a professor of um, cell biology and genetics in Edinburgh and uh, sent, a, sent a gift and her well wishes. So you made your impact on many, many people. So thank you. Vladimir, one thing a lot of people have asked me is, how did we get all those pictures of your family? Could you explain that to everybody? I don't see. No. <laughs> well, a lot of them were given to your neighbors when you all got sent to Terrazin, correct? Those, your photo albums. Your photo albums got saved by neighbors. And that's, that was a question that's come up a few times, is how did all those manage to not be lost, so. And along with the, the travel, the trip over, was so long and difficult. But Julie, you mentioned when you arrived, it rained one day, and you were pushing Vladimir around in the wheelchair, and you told me a, a pretty compelling story. So it was actually the day that we were traveling and um, we were walking into camp and we had been pushing Vladimir in the wheelchair through the mud on the rocky roads that um, they just never, they've left the way they were 75 years ago in the camp. And we didn't, we weren't really aware of it as we were um, walking around that day, but at the end of the day, we realized that the wheels on the wheelchair were caked with this gray mud. And then we looked down at our boots and our shoes and all of our shoes were caked with the same gray, thick mud. And it was, we really felt the impact of what had happened at the camp, um, that mass genocide where um, as Vladimir told the story, uh, that the ashes were just raining down from the sky, and we, we felt like, we really felt like we were walking over um, the, in a way, almost the remains of, of the people who had perished there. It was very, um, very upsetting for all of us, and we went back to the hotel as quickly as we could, and even Vladimir felt the same way and we all washed our shoes and our boots and um, I don't think we really did wash away uh, the feeling that went along with that at the, t at the time that day. Yes, in the blue. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Could you try to speak up a little? You got there at 19 when you were 19 years old. I, she's asking me, how long did it take you to realize how bad it truly was there, what you were walking into? Now, if, I, if it would be possible to change something in the past. The concentration camps the Nazis built and the extermination camps mainly that they built were for purpose to eliminate a race. They decided to kill, all, to, uh, to kill and eliminate all the Jews from Europe. If they will change something in the machinery that they built, they will not succeed. Fortunately, they didn't succeed, but close by. Because now, when the Europe, let's say, is repopulated by some Jews, these are mostly not original Jewish inhabitants of the country. They are moving to the country from far east, 
from now Russia, from Poland, they are moving from Africa, from some other countries. So it's, if you will change Auschwitz, it will not be Auschwitz anymore. It will be something else. Maybe it will permit six million people to live or half of them to survive, but that means that it will not succeed in the purpose of eliminating the whole race from Europe. and you've been in my home too. Um, when, when the pictures of the tanks in Prague came across, I, I realized that there just are no coincidences because you and I were there at the same time. I lived in Prague for six years in your beautiful country and um, it changed my life. I learned to appreciate um, things that I never thought possible that I didn't understand as an American until I lived in Eastern Europe under the communist regime. I want to thank you for something else. Um, you've met my grandson, Luke Vasso, at Lake Forest, and he is a great lover of history, and especially World War II, and someday wants to um, be a filmmaker, and you've touched his life, and it's just incredible to think that we were in the same city at the same time, no idea who we were. You came here, I came here, this is not my hometown. We got to know each other. We shared some times together and some laughs with your beautiful wife. And now you are impacting the life of a young man who was my grandson, and I'm, I'm just very grateful for that. But if I do have a question, it would be what kind of wisdom would you impart to all of us in the tumultuous times that we live in now in our country. Times when people are very afraid and scared of what the future holds for us. From your experiences, if you would share some wisdom for us. Thank you. It's a secret. <laughs> but we do, that is an amazing coincidence. We do know Luke. Um, he's been a great fan of Vladimir's and has been uh, really nice for Vladimir to get to know Luke. And um, we hope he goes on to make some historical films someday. He's a great kid. So, great young man. Yay. <laughs> Next question, this gentleman right here. No, you can take yours off and I'll give you the microphone. Vladimir, when you were in that terrible camp, did you ever see that son of a bitch mangled, the guy that handled all this stuff? You know, the, the, the leader of the Nazis that was given the, the idea that get rid of all the Jews. Mengele, wasn't that his name? Did you ever see him? Did Dr. Mengele. I was young for the three months of, of, of 
slave labor. Yeah. So, so. something okay. about meat. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's highly likely that it was him from some of the research that we've done because he really did his own dirty work, Mangala, and he was at the camp involved in that selection process on a very regular basis, so it's very likely that that was him. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you find not only that you were angry with the Nazis, but those that were complicit and drove the trains, the local police that helped arrest the Jews, do you find yourself angry at them just as much as the Nazis? Why do you think they cooperated so much? For the audience, the question was, uh, are you angry at the Nazis, but also those who helped the Nazis, those who rounded up the Jews, who brought them to the concentration camps? Yes, Many people were, were complicit in the process of keeping us in concentration camp and mainly in the condition of the concentration camp. We kept some of them accountable by, let's say, after the liberation of, of Auschwitz or Birkenau, when we caught them, we hanged them. That was simple. In Terezin, it was not so simple because Terezin was in the Czech Czech country, but they went through the trial and many of them were, were placed in the prison for a relatively long period of time. Many of them died in the prison. Some of them were executed. Some of them, few of them were executed in public, during the public execution soon after the liberation or after the end of the war. Many of them, of course, the minor, the, the minor, the minor persons, they escaped. We didn't know their names. They changed from the uniform to the civilian process and lived their life in Germany, working as a normal profession. So. It's a very, there's a lot of gray areas you after the war. How many, how many people were punished, how many were, how many just escaped? After the war, there were many gray areas because of the Cold War and the fear of the Russians. America took some, you know, of these Germans that really probably should have been hung or should have at least been in prison or for longer, and, and they put them in positions that you know, it's, they were helping to fight the Russians, they said. So, you know, World War II is over, but, but our new Cold War is going on. So, Americans are very, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, record of that. So, one of the things that really struck us was something that was mentioned um, in the presentation that Vladimir saw was a speaker who talked about Auschwitz didn't fall from the sky. It didn't just happen. It started with in the 1920s with simple laws that started to take away people's rights. And that's the way it starts. So as their civilization accepted more and more of inhumanity to, to uh, their residents, it got worse and worse. And the United States and other countries did not take in all of the Jews that they could have. There were boats loaded with children and, and people that were sent back from being able to, to escape this. And so there's, you know, that this is a process. So when you see in your country any kind of white supremacy or any kind of demagoguery, that's the way it starts. It starts very simply and it builds. So I think we have to, you know, take that lesson. It doesn't just start with concentration camps. It starts when we stop respecting people. I think we can all look around and see that at times and 
try to stop it where you can. I saw a hand go up over there, okay. Why was Vladimir left behind at the death camp when uh, with a few of the others? Camp is just my story about the hammer and the liberation of it. We, we were, we marched for two days from our concentration, our concentration, the concentration camp I, I worked, which is Blaivitz, to Blehammer, which is another big concentration camp, a little bit more west from Blaivitz, about 15, 20 miles. The evening we arrived there, I was so tired, dead tired, so I crawled in an empty bed and fell asleep immediately. I woke next morning and the camp was empty. Most of my, most of the prisoners from my camp, Gaivis, were woken up and marched away. People who, who worked in Blackhammer were woken up and marched away. And they forgot some prisoners, either they didn't see us or they saw that we are dead bodies, they left us. So I was not the only one, there were a few more people in, in Blehammer concentration camp. After two days, we had to venture out because there was no food. The, the guards left, the, the camp was open, so I had a I found a friend there, he was a young Romanian youth of my age, and we ventured out and down where we saw some houses. These were the houses owned by the Poles or the German, we don't know, who worked in concentration camp. We kicked the door of the first house we came to, and out the, the, the German, the Nazis were so afraid of Russian and they left everything there and ran away. So we found on the table freshly baked bread. Freshly means two days old. For us, two days old was even now, two days old bread, fresh bread, right? <laughs> we didn't eat good bread for, I didn't get, eat good bread since I was in Terezi, which is since end of 1942 till Beginning of 1945, this was end of January 1945, I didn't eat good bread. The bread for me was a mixture of flour and wooden dust or something like this. Dry, not tasty. So we ate the bread. Then we just went through the house and opened the cabinets and found knives, dresses, clothes. So we stole, we stole, it was not owned by anybody, no one was there. So we packed everything and left. When we got out of the house, in the distance we saw two soldiers. At this time, you couldn't recognize who the soldiers are, Russian soldiers or German soldiers, because they wear over the uniform white blankets. So they just melted with the snow-covered countryside. 
they waved us. So we went to them. And when we came close, we found out that they are two German soldiers who got lost because all the German army was much far west. And at that time, I thought, my bad luck. The first day that I am liberated and out of concentration camp, I meet two German soldiers who definitely will shoot me. Well, they were scared the same way as we were. So they asked us if we saw some Russian soldiers. We of course said, no, we didn't, if we did. And they waved us away. So we were slowly from them, our buttocks tied together. <laughs> I came to be dead. Couple more questions. Yes. concentration camp, did you have flashbacks and horrible memories? Did that bring back horrible memories as you saw your young children becoming to the age uh, where you went through that? It was a different, it's, it's a different generation. I mean, uh, we didn't talk, we didn't talk in our family about concentration camps, about what we went through, until the children who became teenagers and even older started to ask questions. And then we have to explain to them what happened. Peter, the older one, I don't want to say that he dedicated, but he started to read literature about it. And truthfully, he knows more than I know. <laughs> Paul was six years younger, and he was not interested too much about it. So he knows my story. He knows that we both, my, my wife and, my, and myself, that we met in concentration camp. He knows how we dated and how we separated and how we dated again. And, uh, but we never emphasize something like this. We, I personally do not believe that there is a second generation of Holocaust survivor and third generation and fourth generation of Holocaust survivor that a great grandson of somebody who was in concentration camp could have some mental or, or disturbances because his great great grand grandfather or grandmother were in concentration camp. And I think if it's if it, it's really this way, then it's wrong from the parents or the grandparents just to put it on their children or grandchildren that they are different because they were in concentration camp. 
concentration camp or what would be a normal day for you from start to finish? What was a typical day like in the concentration camp? What type of work did you do? Well, um, when I was in Auschwitz-Birkenau and I was a relatively short period of time, I didn't do any labor. We were just standing outside the barrack and waited for the, the dinner or lunch and permission to go back to bed. But soon after, probably three weeks later, I was one selected and sent to so-called satellite concentration camp. Auschwitz-Birkenau was in the, in the Upper Silesia, which was western part of Poland, very industrialized one. And all the companies in 1944 were short of laborer. And they could apply to Auschwitz-Birkenau for prisoners who would work for them. They had to build small concentration camp, concentration camp that had four or five barracks I was in Gleiwitz one, and Gleiwitz had three concentration camps for three big, com big industrial companies. I was for the, I worked for the originally German company that was repairing and keeping railway stations and railway cars in good order. In Poland, in '44, not only in Poland, in Germany, in, in the whole Europe, most of the transportation was done by train not by trucks, by train. And train, of course, was a good target for airplanes and even for the army. They were shooting them. So the broken wagons were brought to our place and we had to fix them, we had to repair them. To repair the wagon for, that was used to transport material, we didn't replace the wooden part with the wood, but we just cut a large hole and put a steel plate over it. I was in charge of heating bolts, large bolts, that were put through the wood and through the plate and fixed by, a, by an electric hammer so that it, was, it holds the, the steel plate. This was a good work because I was a little bit away from the, from the working place. There was a special, special electric oven that heated the bolts, and the German guards didn't come close to me because they were never sure where a crazy Jew will grab a red, a red hot bolt and throw it on me. So they let me be. And not only that, I had to wait always two to three hours because for the part of my group to prepare the plates on the, on the wall of the wagon before I started to heat the bolts and ran with a red hot bolt to them, put them in the plate so that another partner can just make a head to it. I had to use, the German didn't, the Nazis hated somebody else who doesn't work. So at the time when I didn't have, I couldn't work because they were not finished, I had a small pile with grease and I was walking alongside the line of wagons and was greasing every movable part. At the time I looked inside and sometimes I saw in the corner a potato or a turnip or something edible because it was used to transport the food. So I creeped inside, stole the potato or two potatoes, brought them to my place. I had a pile of water there that I, had, I cooled the forceps or the hot, hot bolts when they were not used. And I 
put the potatoes in the water, started to heat the boats, and when they were hot, I threw them in the water, so that the water was not boiling, but was pretty hot, and in a 10-hour shift, I nearly cooked the potatoes to soft stuff, so they were definitely edible. Then I shared them with the rest of my group. So this, I don't, I very, I, I believe that this helped me to survive the hunger. Definitely a little bit of hunger sir, disappeared and maybe I was a little bit stronger that I would be without any extra food. People who couldn't get anything, really, even me, I, I came there on the 2nd of October or in the middle of October and sometimes in the middle of December I go dysentery. I go dysentery not because of infection, but because of the cold. And I was so weak that I had to report to the, to the infirmary, or because otherwise they would send me to back to Auschwitz and kill me. The infirmary took me inside and just to put me in the bed, and I had to share the bed with somebody who was for whatever reason, I don't know, sick. And in the middle of the night, the guy was shaking, shaking, shaking. In the middle of the night, he stopped shaking, he died. He, he died. So in the morning, they took the cadaver out, put another person there. I was there for three days, and three days, three nights, and every morning I woke with a dead body next to me. After three days, they kicked me out, but hey, I was for three days in a warm place and the dysentery disappeared. So I returned back to my work end of December and until, until January 18 when we marched from Lyons to Britain. But that's basically what I did for work in Lyons. Way in the back. Can you talk about how you arrived in Plattsburgh? How you ended up in Plattsburgh? How you ended up in Plattsburgh? If you could uh, share the story again of how you ended up here at Plattsburgh and Plattsburgh oh. State. So, well, when I finished my studies and I started to do research, I published something in a um, in a Czech magazine that was translated to English, and a, prof a, a scientist from Lezerbridge, Alberta, asked, wrote me a letter and asked some questions about my work. And I answered him, and he asked some other questions, and then we started to exchange magazine, and ultimately, for several years, we became pen friends. He was offered a job at SUNY Plattsburgh when, when Plattsburgh was changed from the teacher's college to, to science and art, science art college. He came here as a professor of chemistry. And then he became the chairman of the department and dean of science. And he was inviting me. He, as a sabbatical, came to Prague, so we met personally. I helped him to get visa to Russia, and since then he was inviting me to come as a visiting professor to Plattsburgh. I didn't have time to do it until the Soviets occupied Czechoslovakia in 1968, and I decided to leave the country at least temporarily with my family and wait outside what will happen because the occupation at that time was so similar to the occupation in 1938 when I was small, that I didn't want my children to go through the same thing. And so we contacted, uh, I had a friend at the time in Switzerland, I gave him the, his address, we contacted him and got immediately official invitation to come to Plattsburgh to teach for one year. So we asked permission and we got, uh, at that time it was just the same year that I was awarded the highest, uh, 
baptized Howard for science in Czechoslovakia. So no one believes that I would like to move away from the country because with the award I got, you, you have preferences for everything. And I got permission to, to go to go temporarily for one year to the United States to be transport. I we moved in here I, with my wife and with both children. The children went to the school here. But then there was a change in the count in the government in Czechoslovakia and they decided that they will call all the people who were abroad back home. And they cancelled my official, my originally permission to stay till the middle of February 1970 and cancelled it and I had to return by the end of 1969 which was difficult for me because I was teaching two courses that didn't end at the end of the year, but ended at the end of the January. And I just didn't feel that it would be fair to the college and to the students to let them hang with one month short of finishing the course, which I couldn't give them credit anything. So I, with heart, with heavy heart, I decided not to return back to Czechoslovakia. I asked college here, and they were pretty happy to keep me, and so I decided to stay here. that you had for so many years. Oh, my wife. Well, I met my wife when she was not yet 16 in Terezin, and we started to date. And the problem in Terezin, first of all, in 1940, the dating was a little bit different than it's now. Now it's much more open. In 1940, when you were dating a girl, you were holding hands and walking in the stream of other people, especially in Terezin, that was a city for 5,000 people with 30,000 people there. So there was very difficult place. It was very difficult to find a place at all time where you could be alone with your date. He found out that the, is the, the best place to, to, to be was at the, end, at the end of the day. The curfew in Terezin was eight in the evening. After eight in the evening, everybody has to be in his or her uh, apartment or, or barrack. So I was a locksmith at that time. And I was, I was the youngest one from the shop, and I, my, my standing order was when somebody was somewhere broken, I specialized in fixing doors, windows, hedges, hedges and locks. And when something was broken, they sent for me and I had to go and fix it. It, very often it was after the curfew. So instead of asking always or trying to get through the bureaucracy to get a special permit for a special day, I had a permanent permit to be in the interesting to be outside after curfew. That I showed the policeman or something and that was it. So I was accompanying my girlfriend to her house where she lived with her mother, and we were standing between the door. And the street was practically empty. And when we saw somebody else coming, she just sneaked through the door and was inside the yard. I was outside, but I had permit. <laughs> but once we somehow got too much involved in each other, and the policeman caught us. 
and the policemen asked for IDs and record, reported Kitty, my, my girlfriend, to the uh, to the juvenile court and she was she got a very strict reprimand that she was outside after the curfew, which wouldn't mean anything at, under the normal law. However, in Terezin, when you got special, you got reprimand, that meant that the next transport to the east, which was the next transport to transmit to, to Auschwitz, you would be there. And just to prevent the risk, she appealed the, the judgment of the court, but it would, to, it would take five weeks for the whole process to be processed. So it was recommended by friends for her to pretend that she has some infectious disease. And the infectious disease that could be proved in 1940s was encephalitis. Encephalitis meant you were losing balance, you had headaches, you didn't have appetite, all these things, but there was no PET scan or something that is could prove it. So she was good in pretending these things, so she was locked in the hospital in the infectious department. I visited her outside in the, in the open window, and after, after she got uh, uh, strict reprimand was cancelled, she was released. So that was, and we did, we were breaking. When I was sent to Auschwitz, I had a small anvil that was my apprentice work, and I gave it to her for safekeeping. She returned it to me when I survived, and we met again three citizens in Prague. She had address of my aunt, who was married a German citizen, and when she was, she came back from Terezin, she went over to my aunt and said, my address is this and this. If Vladimir will come back, tell him that I am going to go. So we met and we were dating. Her parents decided to emigrate to the United States where they had some relatives, and because she was not yet 21, she had to go with them. So in 1920, in 1947, she moved with her, with, the, with her parents to the United States. And we stayed in contact when she was not 21 years old in 1949. She just decided to return back to Prague and we got married. question and then we will thank everyone and call it an evening. One more. Well that may be a great way to end it. <laughs> Enjoy the week see you. Somebody already asked the question I was going to ask, but that's okay. I, usually when I ask you a question from the college, I would get yelled at and totally humiliated because I, it was a dumb question. <laughs> and I, you're smart and you don't tolerate rules. Uh, I had a great time tonight. Uh, it was difficult hearing about the tough times that you've been through. Uh, so I'd like to hear maybe a little bit about your choice of coming to Plattsburgh and raising a family here and uh, how it's been good for you because I think you've had a really good life here and. Uh, I'm happy about that. I, mean, I think you're tired. Most of us are. Uh, us old timers. And uh, it's good to see you again, Dr. Monk. And what, yes, what did you like about Plattsburgh and raising your family here? some 
presidet e arbetet e dëmëtatë. tonight to the screening. We want to remind you to tell your friends and family there will be a second screening next Friday, the 24th, 7 o'clock, right here at the Strand. So uh, let everyone know about that. Tickets available at strandcenter.org. And our thanks to Vladimir.